Thank you for joining us for the Aron Debates Europe Volume 4. And today the discussion is about the welfare state. So the welfare state is a sacred cow in Europe, not only in Europe, definitely in the UK when we are told that uh, the NHS is the envy of the world and that without the welfare state, poor people would uh, perish and uh, basically not supporting welfare state means not caring about your neighbor. And the question is, is this the right? Is this narrative the truth? So we are going to discuss this with Greg Scorzo today, who is the debating partner of Yaron. Greg, as you can see on the background, is running Culture on the Offensive, which is a hub interested in dialogue, ideas, philosophy, how we think about the world. I've met Greg, I think it was on a dinner line in a battle of ideas. I didn't know him. And after some minutes of discussion, I became a fan of the fact that he's an unorthodox thinker, but not so for the sake of it. He's not, a, he's not a contrarian, but he's someone with whom you might disagree, but he has interesting things to say. So he's going to take the side, let's say, of the welfare state, or he's going to see some merits in the welfare state, but we're going to see how this goes. And on the other corner, of course, we have Yaron Brook. Yaron is the chairman of the board of the Ayn Rand Institute, and he's an author and the host of the Yaron Brook Show. He has written Free Market Revolution. He has written Equal is Unfair. And probably, if you're around, you know him. So, a big thank you again to the Ayn Rand Institute for supporting these events for sponsoring and helping us morally and materially. And without further delay, you already know the format from the previous discussions, an introduction by Yaron, then some introductory points by Greg, and then we're gonna have some inter-panel discussion, and then you can, you can send at any point your questions via Super Chat. Raz is going to collect the Super Chats, and then the Super Chats through me are gonna pass to the speakers. So, thank you very much, both of you, for being with us. Many thanks to our audience. Let's get started. Yaron, your thoughts on the welfare state. Thanks, Nikos, and thanks, Greg, uh, for agreeing to do this. So, obviously, I am a, an opponent of the welfare state. I'm an opponent for the welfare state for basically two reasons. I think the welfare state is immoral, and I think it's economically destructive, and ultimately politically destructive as well. I think those go together. So let's start uh, with the moral point. I think fundamentally, the welfare state is a dehumanizing institution. It takes people who might be struggling uh, to rise up in terms of their economic status and tells them not to worry, that they have no chance anyway, that they have no shot at the middle class anyway, and that the state will provide them be happy, take the check, and don't be overly ambitious. I think the consequence of this uh, horrific on the first generation who receives this, but I think after several generations, uh, this is unbelievably destructive. And as a consequence, I think in, in, uh, in most societies that implement welfare, uh, the welfare state, you see a significant reduction in social mobility. You see people now rising up, you see a decline in ambition, and decline in striving towards making their lives the best lives that they can be. They are given a signal, a pretty clear signal, that they, in a sense, cannot take care of themselves. Now this, in spite of the evidence of the last 200 years in the United, in, in the United States, in Europe, certainly in Asia and the rest of the world, that an overwhelming majority I mean, I think overwhelming majority is an understatement because I think it's well in excess of 90%, maybe closer to 99%. Our people can indeed take care of themselves, can indeed reach through their own effort the kind of standard of living, quality of life that the welfare state allows them to achieve, at least in places like the United States. But I think this is true of Europe as well. Uh, we, we see this in, in the uh, incredible success of, of, the, of the poor in China uh, and, and, and the hundreds of millions of people have now turned middle class, but you see it in South Korea and Taiwan in, 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 um, in Hong Kong and Singapore. Uh, you see poor people succeeding. <laughs> you see poor people being ambitious. You see people, poor people actually attaining middle classhood. And I fear 
uh, that the welfare state suppresses that within them. And I think this is a moral travesty, a moral, uh, a, you know, a, a, a way in which the state conditions poor people to poverty and institutionalizes them in some sense into poverty. Now, there's also the flip side of this, because not only does it dehumanize the recipient of welfare, but it also dehumanizes the payer into the welfare system. That is the productive, those who have to pay the taxes to pay for the welfare. They are now viewed as, in a sense, sacrificial cows. A big chunk of the reason they work is in order to fund the quality of life, standard of living of those who receive the welfare check. Uh, their purpose in life, or at least the section in the purpose of life, is to serve others. Again, uh, the state institutionalizing a morality of altruism and a morality of sacrifice uh, into kind of the, the social system, into the social economic system, whereby some people pay, other people receive. And this is not only, what's interesting here, is this is not only uh, based on economic status. One of the phenomena of the welfare state is that it is ever growing and that a majority of its growth is not in support of the poor, but the majority of its growth is in support of the middle class. That is, if you look at most welfare, most welfare programs uh, and their expansion, their expansion happens when the beneficiaries of state largesse, call it, uh, are middle class people. And in this case, the transformation or the, the, the redistribution of wealth is not from rich to poor. In this case, the, the, the redistribution of wealth is from young to old. And there is a massive redistribution of wealth from young to old happening in Western countries. Again, I'm familiar with the circumstances in the United States more so than the circumstances in Europe. But it has to be the same in Europe, particularly given the aging population, particularly the low birth rates. It has to be the case that the burden on young people is ever increasing, uh, uh, ever, uh, you know, they're ever more going to place themselves in debt in order to pay for the social benefits to those people who want to retire at 65, 65 an age of retirement set when life expectancy was under 60. And uh, today when life expectancy is well over 80, they get 20 years of retirement often at the expense of young people. I mean, there are many, many ways in which this inhibits the lives of young people, cripples, again, their, their, their ability to invest in themselves, uh, to take risks, to, to, to save, to make sure that they are not dependent on the welfare state for their retirement, ultimately. Uh, so so it, is, it is devastating and crippling to the young. So morally, I think this is offensive to the young, this is offensive to the poor, and this is offensive to... Uh, to those, uh, th those who are successful, who get taxed in order to pay uh, for much of this. It is also, if we're doing this young old, it is, I think, in some deep sense debilitating for the old as well, for people who are going to be old. Uh, people are trained not to save. People are trained not to take care of themselves uh, regarding retirement. People are trained to assume that the state will take care of them and therefore not to think, not to plan, not to invest not to do the kind of things that normally we would do if we faced uncertainty in the future. And therefore, again, it, it limits human po potential, human possibilities, uh, human abilities. Um, so that's, I think, my main uh, uh, problem with the welfare state. It's the fact that it uses coercion and it, it, through coercion cripples everybody it touches. It, it hurts everybody it touches. I'll just mention quickly that I think it's devastating economically. I think it is a waste of resources. It takes money away from investment and, uh, and turns it into consumption. It, uh, it reduces the number of jobs in the, in the economy overall. So it actually reduces the opportunities of poor people to actually engage in, uh, in work so that they can uh, exit uh, poverty uh, because it reduces investment because it's taxing the rich. What is characteristic of taxing the rich? It's, it's taxing investment. Uh, and saving, which go into productive activity to create jobs. 
The same with texting the young, texting the young who are who are who would would save. Uh, it 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 reduces saving rates, uh, which is again unhealthy for economic progress, for economic growth, and for job creation, which hurts more than anybody. It hurts the poor or the ambitious poor, the poor who would like not to be poor anymore. So I think economically it is destructive. It hampers the economy. And from a moral perspective, it is unjust. Thank you very much, Yaron. Greg, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> first off, I wanted to say, um, I'm not going to do the typical thing of saying that the welfare state reduces poverty and capitalism is evil because it makes people poor or any of that. I think capitalism is fantastic. I think it's the greatest system of distribution that human beings have created when it comes to um, generating goods, distributing them efficiently without surpluses and shortages and so on and so forth. So I want capitalism to be the system that wins in the culture wars, politically, economically, and so on and so forth. The problem I have with capitalism is that although it is the best system relative to the alternatives, it has a huge moral problem and that it is a moral paradox. And the thing I like about the welfare state is the welfare state has the capacity to stop it being a moral paradox and turn it into an unconditional moral good, which is what I want it to be because I want capitalism to win. So what do I mean by moral paradox? Well, I mean, it does something really fantastic and amazing, which I just stated, which Yaron talked about a bit, which is the distribution element. Um, and also there's high levels of freedom, high levels of creativity, high levels of dynamism. There tends to be good uh, human rights laws in capitalist societies and so on and so forth. That's the good bit. The bad bit is capitalism um, can uh, generate its wealth by having two sites of two kinds of traders. So there's one kind of trap capitalist trader who is the self-interested trader who trades to optimize their well-being um, and makes those kinds of decisions economically when deciding what kind of a job to get. And then you have the self-abasing trader who basically trades to avoid huge threats like loss of a house, loss of food, loss of health care, loss of running water, whatever it might be. And both of those groups of people are creating the wealth that capitalism thrives off of. And the problem I have is I don't see any moral justification for the self-abasing trader, for the trader who has no support um, and has to go about uh, getting jobs and finding work in a way which is at odds with their well-being. So the difference between like a self-interested trader and a self-abasing trader would be the self-abasing trader would have to ask uh, questions like, you know, who do I have to blow next so, I, so that I can get some drugs and stay on someone's couch for a few weeks? The self-interested trader would say something like, um, should I have a, a flat in Nottingham or a flat in Leicester? Uh, because there might be pros and cons to each choice. Now, my worry, especially in countries that have huge economic booms without welfare states, is that they have a tendency for that economic boom to ride on the base of self-abasing trading rather than self-interested trading, where the majority of the um, process by which people come out of poverty is by having to at least temporarily behave like wage slaves. And the thing that I like about the welfare state is it has the potential to allow everyone to be a self-interested trader rather than a group of self-interested traders and a group of wage slaves. Um, now, you could say an objection to that. Well, what about if the wage slaves, for instance, uh, wind up becoming middle class after they work in the sweatshops for a couple of years? Um, I think that's better than where they started out. I agree on that point. But I don't think that's moral. And I think um, the idea of somebody having to do whatever they have to do to survive, even terrible things, to be able to transition from poverty to non-poverty is a moral problem with capitalism. And it's such a deep moral problem that I think even sacrificing some economic growth is worth making sure that nobody has to be a self-abasing trader. And that's why I think welfare states, at least minimally well-designed welfare states, to guarantee things like housing and uh, health care and food for it instance, are superior to societies that have even huge economic booms without welfare states. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the objections that you're on raised to welfare states. So the first one being coercion. I don't see the coercive element in uh, collecting taxes as particularly problematic because I think that in any kind of a state, um, in order to get the benefits of civilization, you have to be on the recipient end of state coercion. So even a state where there is no taxation, even a state where you get to keep all your money, there are going to be laws. And any state with any law whatsoever is a state that in order to get the benefits of it means you have to be under some kind of coercion coming from the state. 
So for me, the coercion element isn't um, a problem of whether there should or shouldn't be coercion, morally speaking. The issue is what kind of coercion? Are we going to have coercion forms that enable, enable society to produce better outcomes where people feel more free and have more choices and have more security and are able to behave more like self-interested traders? Or are we going to have forms of coercion that dehumanize people? Now, I know Jan thinks that collecting money to give to poor people is dehumanizing, but I'll talk a bit about that in a minute, why I don't agree with that. Um, now, when it comes to the claim that the welfare state has incentivized people to be poor, um, I have two problems with this claim. Uh, the first claim, the first problem I have is it doesn't give the recipient of the welfare check agency. So it says that the lack of um, incentive to work and be entrepreneurial is something that the welfare check does to you rather than something that you choose to uh, be motivated by once you get the welfare check. It's a bit like saying that, you know, video games incentivize people to ruin their lives by playing video games all day long. Therefore, nobody should have video games. I would say there's a multiplicity of different welfare um, incentives that happen when you get a welfare check, one of which might be to sit on your ass and do nothing. What of my, one of which might be to be embarrassed and then think, I want to get some work. And one of, my, uh, one of which might be, um, I'd like to get some work, which actually gives me more money than this welfare check. So there's a multiplicity of different incentives that you can get psychologically when you receive a welfare check. The fact that some people have chosen the bad incentives to be motivated by is their fault. It's not the fault of the welfare check. Um, when it comes to the dehumanizing elements that... Um, Everyone described. I think that the most dehumanizing aspect of not having a welfare state is being in a position where you might have to trade as though you are a slave. You might have to trade as though you have to do whatever it takes to get food and shelter and, and health care, even if you have to take jobs that are potentially bad for you, degrading, humiliating, and things for which um, you might even have um, economic trade-offs that are disadvantageous to you in the long run. Um, that's the, the greatest level of dehumanization that happens in the capitalist society. To then say that the person who has to pay a little bit in taxation is being dehumanized more than the person who has to uh, trade like a slave in order to go from poverty to non-poverty, that seems a bit crazy to me, although I'm open to hearing uh, some arguments as to why it might not be crazy. So um, there's a little bit of uh, ambiguity there, even from me. Um, when it comes to the claim about it being economically destructive, I think we can certainly say that the welfare state doesn't minimize um, inequality um, the way that a lot of people would like it to. But I think what we can say is it adds a level of moral legitimacy to the capitalist society that means that even when it does create uh, certain economic tendencies which cause a lack of growth, as long as the lack of growth is not extreme, it's justified. And the detriment to the economies that welfare states have done to at least the uh, US and, the, and Europe and Canada, I think are thoroughly justified given the moral benefits of what the welfare state can bring. Um, when it comes to things like the welfare state being described as sacrificial rather than altruistic, um, I see it the other way around. I think that the um, welfare state is very much a self-interested um, idea because um, what it means is that you as an agent, if you give a little bit of your money away to the tax collector, you can live in a society in which two things happen. Um, people value dignity and liberty in ways where they won't want you to have to behave like a slave in order to transition from poverty to non-poverty. And also it's a society that will guarantee that no matter where you are, even if you're in the extreme minority, which you aren't described, you'll have a cushion of sorts that wouldn't be there otherwise. And it seems to me that given that, morally speaking, the welfare state does these two uh, things quite effectively, or at least those two things can be done quite effectively if the welfare state is designed well, um, that's enough of a compensation for whatever diminishment of economic growth that the welfare state causes. And given what we know of welfare states, you know, the US and Europe, these aren't places that are doing uh, horrible economically. If we talk about the last 50 years, these are not economic disasters. These are relatively prosperous societies. So whatever damage that the welfare state is doing, I think is compensated by the moral benefits of giving capitalism a level of moral legitimacy that it would not have otherwise. And with this moral legitimacy, hopefully capitalism can win in the battle between capitalism and its alternatives. Thank you, Greg. So this is the 
the part where we do the rebuttal. So Yaron's gonna have some like five minutes, and then Greg's gonna have five more minutes. Jonathan raises a metaphorical super chat glass to Yaron, and in honor of his. So thank you very much, Jonathan. So uh, again, you can send your questions via super chat. So now let's go to the rebuttal phase, the discussion phase. So Yaron, and then Greg. Sure. Uh yeah, I mean, my, my main concern here is with the, with the premise, this idea that there was a moral problem. I don't see a moral problem. It, it's not like um, everybody was doing uh, phenomenally well. Uh, in, in, nobody had to take uh, jobs that they didn't like. Uh, people were living long, happy, successful lives and in income capitalism and uh, destroyed that utopia. The fact is that uh, nature... Uh, nature creates a circumstance in which human beings are poor. That is the state of nature uh, for human beings. It is a massive achievement to rise up from poverty. And I don't view uh, taking jobs. Now, yes, if you have to blow somebody, but most people don't actually have to do that. 99.9% um, uh, .9 of poor people don't have to do that in order to rise out of poverty uh, and haven't done that in history. But yes, it's, it's hard work to get out of poverty. It was hard work 300 years ago before capitalism to get out of poverty. Um, and 90% of people didn't succeed at doing it. And we're held back by the authorities who didn't want them to succeed. Uh, finally, people were liberated. People worked hard and rose out of poverty. I don't believe anybody, particularly in Western states today, who is not either mentally deficient or crippled has to engage in truly self-abasing activities in order to uh, survive, in order to do okay. Uh, economically in a Western country today. They might have to take a job they don't like. Okay? So what? Uh, the, so I, I don't find that morally offensive or morally problematic. Again, morality, in my view, is about the pursuit of your life. It's about uh, you, the pursuit of your own flourishing. It's about the pursuit of your own success as a human being. Part of that requires you to do the kind of jobs that might be necessary in order to rise up from poverty. I, I, when I was a teenager, I used to uh, uh, sweep the floors in our condo building and, and, and sweep the trash cans, which today I look upon and it, it feels like the most disgusting thing I've ever done, right? But, but so what? You know, that's what I did as a teenager, you know, to make some bucks. I didn't view it as self-abasing. I viewed it as that was the thing you had to do to make some money so you could have money so that you could live better. So uh, the whole framing of it in terms of wage slaves, I don't think there is such a thing. I think that's a, that's a, that it's demeaning to slavery. I mean, it's, a, it's unfortunate because it puts down uh, the true horror of slavery. Ha slavery is, is truly horrible. And to compare it to people who, who have a job, even in a sweatshop, is just unjust to the slaves, right? Uh, slavery is, is, much, is, is, is about violence. It's about coercion. It's about force. And it's, a, it's about no options and no alternatives under any circumstances. That is not the same as what a wage a person does. And it's certainly not equivalent to the lifespan of, of, of somebody entering the workforce and how they progress through that workforce. So I think the whole moral framing, we disagree about the whole way in which we frame this. Capitalism is, the, capitalism is moral because it is a system that leaves people free to engage in those jobs that allow them to pursue their values um, without somebody dictating to somebody, oh, no, that's a wage. That, that's itself the basic job. You shouldn't have to do that. Let me give you a check so you don't have to do that. Who is anybody to tell somebody what is and is not a self and basic job? Um, yeah, I think, I think the, it's important to know kind of the, 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 the starting point of almost everybody. Okay, there's a lot here. Um, agency yeah I, I agree with your commentary about agency at the end of the day yes the poor person has to accept but incentives matter they don't dominate necessarily they don't overwhelm everything else but at the margin they matter and at the margin a person who might have been ambitious and might have gone out and done something with his life at the margin because he gets a check from the government might not particularly when you consider that almost every welfare state is designed in a way that the marginal tax rate of getting a job of that first income is something like 70, 80%, right? 
So uh, you, 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 it's just not worth getting that job because you're making more money on the welfare state. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's at the margin. I also would claim that after several generations, there's a certain inculcation into culture. And let's not ignore culture. There's agency, but there is an impact of culture. And people who grew up in a culture of welfare find it more difficult to escape than people who don't grow up in a culture of welfare. Um, and finally, yeah, moral benefits versus growth. I, I mean, this to me is, again, who are you to make that calculation? Who is anybody to make that calculation? Leave us free. You know, we could easily voluntarily recreate the welfare state. We can dedicate 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of our, well, of our income to charity and reduce economic growth and improve the welfare of the poor through charity without having coercion and without a philosopher king or somebody in authority telling us what the trade-off needs to be between moral benefits and economic growth. We could, we could make that a voluntary decision that we make as individuals. Um, so, I, I, and then, you know, uh, Greg said a number of times, a well-designed welfare state. I'm, I'm curious if he has one in particular in mind. Um, because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not familiar with very many. Certainly, the United States welfare system is about as badly designed, even from the perspective of a welfare, uh, a believer in welfare, as possible. And I see no efforts to try to better design it. I see many efforts to try to make it even worse designed than possible. So I, uh, I will leave it at that. That's five minutes, I think. Thank you, Yaron. Greg, rebutals to the rebutal. Okay, so um, when it comes to the uh, benefits morally versus growth, who decides problem? For me, that answer uh, is answered by the population. It's democracy and voting that decides whether or not we have a welfare state or whether we don't. It's not a philosopher king. So I'd be happy to live in a society where there's no welfare if the people didn't want it. But if people do want it, I think there are good reasons to support the people in choosing to have one. Um, when it comes to charity, I think actually that if you are against the welfare state, I don't know how you can consistently be in favor of charity. Because if you think people deserve whatever financial amount of money they have, and if they're poor, they deserve to be poor, I don't see how you can then justify giving people who deserve to be poor money in the name of charity any more than you can justify giving them money through the welfare state either. Um, either people deserve money they don't have when they're poor, or they don't. And if they don't deserve money, um, I don't see why you would uh, give people who don't deserve money money. You might say that the benefit of charity is, well, it's voluntary rather than coercive, but I don't see why you would voluntarily give, people poor, uh, give poor people money if you thought that being poor was a kind of justice of sorts that was based on not making good choices in the marketplace, not taking opportunities, sitting on your ass, and so on and so forth. Um, now, a lot of what Yaron said, I think, is really interesting because when you get into the real defenses of having to work hard in the capitalist economy without a welfare state, to me, it starts to sound like collectivism. It starts to sound like wanting to do shit work, which you don't like for the greater good of making sure nobody has to pay for it. And potentially you can in the future uh, maybe go from poverty to middle class or poverty to non-poverty. But what you certainly can't do is choose what jobs that you particularly find degrading or not. You have to depend on other people to give you whatever work is there, even if the work is quite bad for you. Now, I agree with you on that probably the majority of people who are poor don't have to give blowjobs. But I think there are a lot of jobs for a lot of different kinds of people that are as bad as having blowjobs, given their particular temperaments and their particular needs. Because part of what capitalism does, which is good, is it makes us all quite sensitive to the fact that there's a diversity of different kinds of people in this world. And for some people, things that are pretty easy um, are for other people really, really difficult to the point where they can't do them. Certain people with mental health conditions couldn't do the kind of, uh, you know, picking up of garbage that Yaron talked about doing earlier on um, and vice versa. There are some people that find sex work really easy, but who find working in an office something that would give them panic attacks. Um, well, the absence of a welfare state basically says it doesn't matter who you are, what your particular conditions are, what your subjectivity is, what your self-interest is, even, you have to do whatever other people need you to do in order to make sure that they don't have to pay for you, even if they can quite easily pay for you. So to me, that sounds very much like a, a collectivist idea, more than an individualist idea. Because what it does is it makes you subservient to the voluntary choices of others who are better off than you are. Um, and it makes you, until you reach the point where you have economic autonomy and can trade like a self interested trader, something like a slave. Now, the reason I think wage slavery is actually a good thing to talk about and why it's not demeaning to slaves is, is, is it says, look, if the relationship that you have to your employer has 
too many features in common with slavery, that means you have a bad relationship to your employer. If you're doing things that are like what a slave is doing in A and B and C and D and E, that means this is not a good relationship between labor and capital you have. So it's really important, I think, to talk about wage slavery, not because we're saying that people who are wage slaves are literally slaves. We're saying we want to make people who earn wages as far away from slaves as possible. When there are too many analogies between a working person and a slave, that means the conditions under which people are working needs to change. Okay, let's go to a couple of super chats and then Yaron will have more chance to, to, to get back. So Jeff says, send a super chat in honor of the t-shirt that Raz was wearing yesterday. For more of that, go to RC UK store to get the inside joke. But Marilyn asks uh, Greg, so Greg, you use the term coercion. Mm -hmm. Marilyn asks, who gets coerced? Uh, so who is coercing whom? Because Coercion means that someone is coercing you into something and coercion has a definition. So when you say that people get coerced to work, mm -hmm. can you a bit uh, get deeper into that and tell us what do you mean by coercion and who is coercing whom? Well, there's individual coercion where an individual might coerce you to do something, but then there is social coercion where the entire society coerces you to do something. And in a world without a welfare state, you're being coerced to take whatever work is there, no matter how bad it is for you no matter how degrading it is for you. And that seems to me to be something that people in capitalist societies are finding increasingly unethical because one of the great things about capitalism is it makes you more sensitive. Okay, Yaron, you can reply to this and then we're going to get to yeah, the I next mean, super chat for Greg. I, I mean, this is, this is a, uh, I think, a very, very wrong application of the word coercion. I don't think that you are... Uh, the, the fact, the metaphysical fact in nature that you have to work in order to survive and uh, that survival is not a given. There's no the food, you know, you, you, you're not just going to wander around eating fruit and nuts and, and actual work has to happen. Whether that work is hunting and whether that work is agriculture, some work has to happen in order for you to survive. And that is not coercion. That's not nature coercing, coercing you to work. So indeed, nobody, society is not coercing you to work in order to survive. Uh, nature is in, in a sense, right? Reality is. The, the, the metaphysical fact of reality is the need to uh, change the world around you to, to feed you because uh, we are not, we're not granted with uh, the genes to just know exactly what to do in order to feed ourselves, in order to survive. We as conceptual beings actually have to work to survive. That's, that's the nature of man and the nature of the environment or the, the world in which, in which uh, we live. It's a given, uh, you know, if, if, if you're religious, it's the consequence of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And, and what's amazing to me is the extent to which the Garden of Eden metaphor uh, myth is stuck in people's minds, right? Some, we live in some kind of ideal where we just lay around and stuff comes to us, right? Uh, no, no effort needs to be engaged in order to achieve a survival, that's bizarre. That, that, that is one of the great, great, great sins of religion that it has uh, given us that mythology. No, in order to survive, we need to work, just like any other animal needs to work. And therefore, it's not coercion. That is the fact of reality. Now, we do engage in coercion. When we, we take from Greg to give to Nikos, because Nikos, for whatever reason, doesn't want to work, can't work, is incapable of work. That indeed is coercion. If Nikos dies because he cannot work, he was not cursed into death. He dies. That's nature. That's the way it is. If you don't work, you die. Now, somebody could help Nikos, or somebody can take stuff from Greg and give to Nikos. Those are two options in which we provide to Nikos. But the one is coercion, and the one is voluntary, and that's the difference between coercion and charity. Uh, we can talk about the justice of charity. Um, so uh, laws that are protective in nature, laws that protect individual rights, laws that help define and protect property rights, are not coercive laws. They're coercive towards those who initiate force. But if you initiate force, you are the one who started the force and therefore coercion doesn't apply to you. Right? If I punch you, we don't say Greg defending himself is using coercion. You say Iran used coercion and Greg defended himself. Right? Those are two different activities. The coercion is the initiation. So I, I, think, I think this is important. And again, it goes to the nature of, 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 of slavery. There is nothing in common. I mean, I, mean, I mean, nothing in common between wages and slavery. Slavery is the initiation of force by one human being over another. 
and they're placing him under severe constraints. A, and, a, you know, there might be circumstances in certain countries where people are forced into labor. And then you could argue it's, it's slavery. But, but the metaphysical fact that you have to work in order to survive does not make a job anything like slavery. Even a job you don't like. Even a job you don't like that you have to do for many years. Uh, there are lots of things we do in life that we don't like, and if, but we don't attribute them to coercion against us. Okay, hey, gentlemen, uh, as a result of the discussion being interested, we have too many super chats, so I have to start asking you to maybe cut a little bit the length of the answers. We're so, going to have to charge UK, uh, ARC UK more money in the future, given how, uh, how profitable they're becoming <laughs> with all these super chats. Well, so super chat from super KPL. So to Greg... So, yeah. Greg, you talked about self-abasing people. And the question is, aren't there self-abasing people in the welfare state? I don't see how the welfare state mitigates that problem. The self-abasing people uh, that exist in the welfare state are being self-abasing of their own volition. The self-abasing people in the market are being self-abasing because they don't want to lose their house. Uh, they don't want to fail to be able to eat. They don't want to die because they can't pay for medical bills. That's the difference. Um, I agree with Yaron uh, very quickly about how you have to work in nature to survive. And that is quite a brutal fact of nature. But I think a society is supposed to be distinct from a state of nature and that it's supposed to make the ways that you survive less brutal. Um, and if the ways that you survive are less brutal depend on people having to pay a little bit of money that uh, is quite easy for them to pay, uh, I'm all for that because the other relationship that you have to society where everybody gets to keep their money because everyone's afraid of coercion is one where you're subservient to the market, even if you're rising on the economic ladder, which I'm against, uh, because I don't think anybody should be subservient to anyone. Um, and I think uh, people often assume that, um, again, coercion is the sort of thing that is really, really terrible that nobody should ever do. But again, if you never do coercion, you can't live under any state at all, because any state law, even a non-economic law, even a case of a state law where you're not having anything taken away from you financially, that's still a form of coercion. So the issue isn't whether we should or shouldn't have coercion. It's what kinds of coercions are optimal for achieving human flourishing, including a sense of human freedom, versus what coercions from the state diminish those things significantly. But coercion itself... Um, is a fact of life, just like survival is, but we can have good coercion and good survival rather than no coercion and really brutal survival in a capitalist society, which is supposed to be better than that. So can I just, I, I want to challenge this idea that survival in the capitalism is brutal, even for those who, who have tough jobs. Um, I don't think it's, I, I don't think that's the case. I think part of the challenge is that we've lived under a welfare state for so long, we don't know what the potential of capitalism, and this relates to this trade-off between growth and, and, uh, and moral, uh, um, moral benefits. If we look at the evolution of jobs from the early 19th century to the mid-20th century, uh, a period where the, the United States at least didn't have a welfare state, uh, and you see the changes in the kind of jobs that people are engaged in, you see a massive increase in the variety of jobs. So people can choose. So it's not true that low-income jobs in, in, in a capitalist society all have to go to sweatshops, right? It, it, it's, it's amazing the wide variety and, and, uh, of jobs that people have. People can choose between to work in a nail salon, to collect garbage, to work in a factory, or to go and work at a startup and rise on the bottom, or to take night classes and become programmers and, and, and be successful, and a whole and a million other options. Uh, this idea that capitalism is a mono, uh, monolithic of one type of job for everybody, and therefore everybody's stuck in this one type of job, is, I think, a complete falsehood. Uh, capitalism produces exactly the opposite. It produces a plethora of a wide variety of, 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 um, of, of jobs that people actually can self-select uh, and choose what to take. Now, we live in societies in which, um, because I think of state control and because of the welfare state, and, and again, Greg, Greg uh, articulates the, the puny amount of money we have to pay for welfare. Um, I used to live in California where I used to pay 50, over 50% of my income to the state, most of which ultimately went to welfare programs. I mean, overwhelming majority of that went to welfare programs. Uh, uh, certainly that's true in the United States. I think it's even more true in the, in the UK and other places. Um, so no, it's a significant amount of money that goes to welfare programs. Um, if you took that money, 
and he actually invested in capitalism, the amount of jobs and the interesting jobs and the variety of jobs would be even dramatically greater than it is today. And, this, and, the, and the pay for those jobs, because productivity rises all the time, would be dramatically higher. So, you know, poverty is probably ultimately not even an issue under capitalism if we actually allow capitalism to happen. But we don't. At the height of the crisis in Greece, my father was paying close to 75% in, in taxes. Okay, next question is on charity, which is good because I think it's a part where more could be said. So, Marilyn says, didn't we have a pretty good private charity system in this country, in the States, 100 plus years ago? Incidentally, I scrubbed floors and cleaned toilets when I was young. Same here, Marilyn. And first time I could say I really made good money in my, ma in my life was when I was sweeping uh, roads in the morning. Surprisingly well-paying uh, job. And I had my podcast on, so it was actually also an easy job. Anyway. That's because the Greek government taxes everybody at 75%, per 75 so they can pay street sweepers. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. Well, that was actually in Kent. They but... good money off of the state. All right, now, <laughs> now we get it. That was in Kent, but uh, the, point is, the point is correct. Okay, so good charity. And actually, Greg, if you see the statistics, the, the, high, the lower the taxes, the more people would give to the charities. And actually... We believe in solidarity and human agency, so shouldn't we prefer a system where you choose who you help and you build this, let's say, bo uh, the, the, this ground roots, this, this ground roots networks? Um, to answer that question, I would say um, one virtue of charity is it's voluntary, but the downside is it's very difficult to justify it. Um, because if you believe that people should have the amounts of money they have, because those are products of dessert based on what they've done in the market, based on trying to get voluntary exchanges of money, um, to give someone charity is like coming up with a de facto welfare state. It's voluntary, but it's still a kind of welfare state. Um, so I don't see why you would want to give to charity if you were consistent, if you didn't like welfare states, number one. And number two, the reason why I would prefer a welfare state to charity is because I wouldn't want someone to only not be self-abasing in the way that they made money if other people voluntarily gave them money, because that's the problem with the capitalist market without the welfare state in the first place. It's contingent. It's precarious. It depends on whether or not you can find someone who will pay you to do what they want you to do. And then that means to some extent you're under their control. So if you want a society where everybody can uh, trade in the market as a self-interested trader with maximal freedom for themselves to decide which jobs they want, which ones they don't, um, you have to have a welfare state that allows for people to um, have enough of a financial cushion to not have to be beholden to others in such a brutal way. Um, and in response to what uh, Yaren said about the diversity of jobs in the capitalist market in the last 150 years, I don't disagree with any of that empirically. Um, but morally, what I would say is, even if capitalism comes up with more and more jobs for more and more people, there's still going to be a minority of people for whom either the jobs that they need aren't available to them, or it's not good for them to do the jobs that are. And those are the people that need cushions. And if you have a society with the minimal amount of people like that possible, great. But I don't want to live in a society that as long as it has a lot of economic growth, essentially tells those people in order to survive, you have to be subservient to others and do things that you find horrible. Because that, to me, doesn't sound like a free society. That sounds like a collectivist society where there's lots of subservient power relations. That's unnecessary, given that there's so much wealth in that society anyway. Yaron. So it takes me the exact opposite, right? As you were saying this, I was thinking, wow, that is a quite a collectivist, eth an ethical collectivistic perspective, right? Because the standard here is not individual liberty, individual freedom. The perspective here is that the individual's, uh, individual's ability. It's somebody's, uh, somebody doing, because any society, even in the office there, we know this, there's certain people who, for whatever reason, are unhappy. There's some people in the welfare state who take self-abasing jobs. There's some people in the welfare state who are not going to achieve. And it's okay because there's some people to sacrifice other people for their sake. Now, I consider it a sacrifice. I consider taking 50% of my income uh, a, a, an act of sacrifice against me. I consider that a, 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 a limitation on my ability to pursue my happiness on my ability to pursue. So we're taking one group, a minority. I think we all agree it's a minority who can't take care of themselves, who might find these self-abasing jobs for, as a necessity. And we're, we're structuring the whole society and all of our hierarchies and all of our values and how much we get 
to keep of our own production in order to satisfy this group. I think that is a collectivist way of organizing society and in, 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 in distortive. Um, yes, life can be rough during periods of time. Life can be rough for certain people. Uh, most people who have agency, who choose to engage in being human, find that, that th those rough periods are short and they can overcome them and they can strive to, to be better. But let me, let me address the charity point from, from two perspectives. One is I think the beauty of charity is the charity is uh, much more likely to engage in dessert. That is, you're absolutely right, Greg. Certain people don't deserve the welfare state in my mind and don't deserve charity. And I don't think they get it. So I, I was using my talks, I used the example of the wife beating drunk, right? I don't think the wife beating drunk should get charity. I don't think he should get dessert. He should get a welfare check either. Now he does today. He gets a welfare check in spite of the fact that he's a wife beating drunk, that he's never going to go work, that he's never going to do anything to promote his own life, that he's hurting other people in some significant way. He's, he's neglecting his kids. He probably has a bunch of them. And he's just a bad human being. And yet he's getting paid for that. A charity system is much more likely to be a system that allocates the, 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 the money that people decide based on desserts. And therefore, that's why people would give. So if somebody came to me and said, I have a charity that gives money to white beating drunks, I would say, I'm not giving you a dime. But if somebody came to me and said, I've got a charity that helps young kids who, uh, who are born in poverty get a better education so they can rise up from poverty. I'm saying, yeah, absolutely. They deserve that. It's not their fault that they were born in poverty. I want to help those kids get the best education that they can. And, 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 and you know, we can all, based on our individual value scale, what we perceive as deserve, deserving, uh, you know, there's a charity that helps people whose businesses burned down and didn't have insurance for some reason or whatever. Now, I'd add to that that the markets are very creative. So in the 19th century in the U.S., in addition to a lot of charity, there were also uh, insurance again un against unemployment. There, there, was, there was insurance against poverty. There was, uh, there was mutual aid societies. So all kinds of market mechanisms to deal with the issues of accidents and, and bad outcomes and, and, and difficult situations. Uh, and that's in a society that was not very rich as compared, certainly as compared to societies today. I mean, that was just the beginning of capitalism when society wasn't very uh, prosperous. So uh, I, I, I much prefer charity. I think it would be, uh, uh, you know, uh, because it is aligned with the giver's values. All right. Thank you. So Jonathan says, asks, so Greg, you mentioned this situation where an employer has a bad relationship with the employee. You mentioned it in your, I think, in your opening remarks. And mm -hmm. Jonathan asks, is capitalism responsible for a bad relationship between an employer and an employee? Or is, it, or is that more of a human feature? Um, well, it certainly can be a human feature if you've got two essentially fucked up people or one fucked up person working in an environment where there's... Sorry, a, we're going to get demonetized. Then sorry, uh, <laughs> messed up, me, not effed up, messed up. Um, but market pressures, market situations, market contingencies, and so on can create situations in which people have to work in environments that are objectively bad for them. And because there is such a diverse array of different kinds of human beings, um, we can't allow um, any kind of hard and fast rules about what is good or not good for you when you get a job, unless you can choose that to some extent for yourself if you live in a free society. If you can't choose that for yourself, if you have to go wherever the work is, even if it's you know something horrible, um, then I don't see how you're free. Um, when it comes to things like um, being an entrepreneur as an expression of your reason and so on, to me, being entrepreneurial um, is a talent. It's like being a good musician. I love entrepreneurs, but I wouldn't expect everyone to be one. And I wouldn't say that you don't deserve to have a house or basic necessities if you're a bad entrepreneur, any more than I'd say that if you were a bad musician. And when it comes to charity, um, I think what I would say in response to Johan is the kind of relationship between the charity giver and you in the charity that he supports is one where you're subservient to them because if they don't like you for whatever reason, you don't get their charity. Even if it's for a reason that's much worse than they don't like you because you're a drunk that beats your wife. Maybe they don't like you because you have brown skin. Maybe they don't like you because you're fat. Maybe they don't like you for all sorts of reasons that have nothing to do with what you deserve. Um, so again, in situations where you're having to do things for other people that you don't choose um, and, and that don't express what you think are best for yourself, given your innate preferences of what's good for you, what's valuable for you, I don't see how you have a lot of autonomy. 
even if you live in a capitalist society with a lot of growth, a lot of growth and a lot of uh, formal freedoms in it. Okay. Uh, shall we go to the next super chat or yeah, I don't have got something burning? I just I find this idea that we need to be free of other people's judgments. And, uh, you know, just bizarre. So I, I, I'm, it's okay for me to coerce you into giving me money. And that allows me to be free. But if I have to ask you for money, that is somehow uh, I'm now dependent on you in a way that my coercing you uh, eliminates that dependency. I mean, one of the, one of the messages of Atlas Shrugged is um, maybe you're dependent on me even if you're coercing me because, you know, if I stop working, you can't take my money anymore. And, and if the welfare state collapses because people won't pay into it, then you're dependent on it as well. But it's in, every, in all situations in life, uh, you know, so many situations in life, uh, you know, you, you have a book coming out on love, but even in, in love relationship, there, there is a certain dependence on the other person reciprocating. And if they don't, they don't, and, and you're screwed, right? And that's life. And to, to somehow say, uh, no, I need to create a situation where I'm not dependent on other people's, that, you know, that's not freedom. Freedom is, sometimes freedom in, in, involves rejection. Sometimes freedom involves, I have to do things I don't want to do, I don't like doing, uh, because I haven't satisfied whatever, whatever uh, you know, cause is necessary in order to, or, or, or activity is necessary in order to lead to a particular cause. So... I don't understand why in economics it's somehow, oh no, I need to, you have to have some kind of flaw um, that's okay and it's okay to use coercion because his feelings might get hurt or he might feel like he's dependent on him. Yeah, he's absolutely dependent on him and I want him to know that he's dependent on him because I want him to get out of that dependency. I want him to, 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 to take it seriously and I think this is what charities would do that he needs to get up on his own two feet and, 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 and do something worthwhile with his life. And I think that's what private charity succeeds much better at. Okay, know? so from now on, I'll have to do the, three, the super chat three at a time and you pick what you answer. Greg, battle of idea style. So, I hate George the battle, says this battle of idea style, just so you know. Sorry? I hate this battle of idea style, just so you know. Well, hopefully in October you're going to see that. No, again I, goes... I, I, I am, I am, I am, I've accepted the fact that sometimes I have to do things I hate. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> so the taxpayer forced to pay for welfare state, says George, is way closer to being a slave than an employee entering into a mutually voluntary transaction. That's a statement, not a question, so I'll include it with the other question. <laughs> the analytic synthetic dichotomy says... Should people who aren't forced to pay direct taxes in our current system have the right to vote? So should people who aren't forced to pay taxes have the right to vote? And the third question is not being allowed to coerce, i.e. is not being allowed to commit a crime, basically. Coercion. So basically, this, I assume this goes to the, to the, to the point of Greg on how he defied Question. So, you, gentlemen, you pick whatever you want from this and you run, and then we have another set of some super chats. Do you want to so go or do you want me to go? Yeah, I'm happy to go. So let me just say, it, 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 this also relates to something Greg said. I mean, in this context, I, you know, I'm not a big fan. I'm not a fan of democracy in terms of absolute majority rule. Um, it, it goes to the point Greg earlier said, people choose to do this, so therefore, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. Um, I don't think the collective, in that sense, has a right to rule over the minority. Uh, the limits have to be the limits that I think are specified or attempted to be specified in the American Constitution. That is the limits of individual rights. The majority does not have a right to coerce the individual. And I don't agree that all laws are coercive. Uh, laws are there to protect us from coercion by other people. Um, so, uh, so the fact that people want it, I don't think, and this relates to this voting Look, I think the issue of who should be allowed, allowed, who should vote uh, or not vote is a complex issue. Uh, you know, when we get to uh, uh, live in a free society where that becomes an issue, you know, where you have voluntary taxes, should people who don't pay the voluntary taxes, should they be allowed to vote or not? That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I have a particular view on it, but I don't think it's that important given the context in which we live. And I can't remember the last one. This is the problem with three questions. I can't keep track of them. My crow busts are two. 
The third one was for Greg because it had to do with the definition of coercion yeah. and basically it said that... Anyway, I'll let Greg uh, deal with it. Okay, so is not being allowed to coerce... Uh, I'm sorry, is not being allowed to commit a crime an example of coercion? For me, yes, definitely. Any law is an example of coercion because what a law does is it says whatever you would like to do that this law prohibits you from doing, you can't do. So whatever freedom you had to walk into my house, I've taken away from you by having this house legally be my house. Um, if you want to walk into my house with impunity and do whatever you want. So any law whatsoever, any benefit of civilization that comes from laws is actually a byproduct of coercion. So like I said, for me, the problem isn't whether there is or isn't coercion. It's what kind of coercion. Um, with regards to the question about um, democracy, um, I think that democracies are an essential condition of having any kind of law that functions in a way which is stable. I think all rights are fundamentally precarious. You have to argue for them no matter what. They can always get challenged. Even our most cherished rights need to be subjected to routine reviews. And that's why even though I'm pro-choice, for instance, I don't agree with prohibiting people from raising uh questions about whether or not we should have a pro-life society, even though I'm not in favor of that. Um, and when it comes to the idea about um, why should, in the name of freedom, everyone be forced to give you money that guarantees your freedom rather than have people contingently give you money, um, I think this is a point Yaren made, um, I think the answer is that if you want to have a essential freedom for somebody, it has to be universal. It can be contingent on whether or not they like you or whether they think you're a wife beater. And it's very similar to protection. You can't have a police force if the police say, I don't really want to look after the Mexicans. I don't like them, but I'll look after the white people. So freedom, if it's guaranteed, even if it's freedom from having to be a self-abasing traitor, that has to be universal. It can't be contingent on people's whims any more than protection can be contingent on people's whims if you want to have protection in your society. Um, and finally, the, the question about whether um, taxpayers should be allowed, sorry, was the question people who don't pay taxes, should they be allowed to vote? Was that the question? I think so, you address it with your democracy answer, but yeah, that's the question. Um, the answer to that question is, I think I would probably agree with Yaren on that one. I don't know. <laughs> Okay. Right. So next and probably last round of uh, Super Chats because we are almost at the... Uh, so Vegard says, it should be clarified that a lot of people who live off the welfare state are content but not necessarily happy. Just look at Finland and Norway. Next question. What is the epistemological justification that an individual may ignore reality to survive, think and produce yet sustain himself by leeching off the productive minds of others. Do rich people have a basket of fish that produces infinite, infinite sustenance? Sustenance. Another question. Yaron, do you agree with your opponent's claim that the welfare state, that the welfare system reduces the amount of self-abasing traders, at least the ones who do it out of necessity? And last super chat. I've learned of many treacherous people who receive welfare. If we get rid of it, could that potentially increase property crime? So basically, if, we, if, if without welfare, wouldn't you expect crime to rise? I'm not sure what treacherous refers to, but I think you get the gist of the, the point of the question. Okay, last round. If you think something should be mentioned, now is the time. So why don't you go first since I started? Okay. Um, with regards to happiness, I'm probably a bit skeptical about happiness studies as a guide to anything. Yeah. Uh, happiness strikes me as kind of a subjective notion when people try and set out the conditions of happiness and statistical analysis that always seems a bit question begging to me, or it seems like they're always missing out important information. So I wouldn't be particularly persuaded by somebody who says, let's be more like Sweden with a welfare state like theirs because they're more happy. Uh, because I find those kind of arguments a bit like uh, sleights of hand um, to try and avoid the actual difficult questions about why ethically we should have a welfare state, which may be more like theirs, even though ironically their welfare state in some ways is more right wing than the US one, but nobody talks about that. Um, the second uh, question, what about ignoring reality uh, to take money away from the productive? I think if you engage with reality and you ask yourself, what kind of a society do I want to live in? 
the answer is a society in which I'm not so beholden to others and their fickle decisions that my life involves me having to make decisions where I'm constantly self-harming to have outcomes that are like the other members of my society who live relatively okay lives. You want to create a society in which everyone can live a relatively okay life, or at least have a pathway towards that, where there is as minimal as possible um, self-abasing elements involved in the capitalist trading, if it's a capitalist society. And um, it's I agree with the uh, criticisms about too much money being taken away for the welfare state, too much taxation. But to me, that's a bureaucratic issue about how to efficiently design the welfare state. That's not an ethical um, blow against the welfare state. The only kind of economic blow against the welfare state that I would consider serious would be that if a welfare state transformed an economy from like a first world to a third world economy, then I would say maybe welfare states are economically calamitous. But because everywhere I know that has a welfare state seems to be doing okay enough, and the ways in which um, the welfare state correlates with economic uh, problems or a lack of growth, um, even in those cases, I'm not certain that it's the welfare state rather than a correlation with the welfare state. There might be other problems that are also contributing to the economic uh, difficulties that those countries are having other than the welfare state. So again, I'm always leery of trying to conflate uh, correlations with causation, even in those circumstances. Um, so yeah, I think at the end of the day, we should try and make our capitalist project that we believe in as morally decent as possible, given that capitalism as a whole tends to make us very sensitive to the diversity of human beings and the kind of things that we need. And that's not going against reality. That's actually appreciating finer details of reality that more survival-based societies are more insensitive towards because they're only interested in surviving. But when you can have a society that really excels at allowing people to thrive rather than survive, it's understandable that people in that society would become more sensitive to the elements of domination that exist when people are in survival mode, which presumably a capitalist society should try and create something better than. And it does in many, many respects, except when there's no welfare state. When there is a welfare state, despite the problems, it at least seems to me that the capitalist state is trying to grapple with the fact that it needs to balance its productivity and, and its efficiency and its innovation and its dynamism with a concern for those people who might be marginalized by that very same system and have to work in ways where they are self-abasing rather than self-interested because I want a society where everyone is a self-interested trader in the capitalist world rather than anybody you know uh, who is self-abased either because of the market or self-abased because they live in some sort of a capitalist society, uh, sorry, a communist society or anything like that, which is deeply inferior to capitalism. So um, I just want to end by saying um, I hope that this, whatever I've said, might go towards the project of making capitalism more defensible to a greater number of people. So before we go to Yaron, just to read this super chat, because I think it's, uh, it's very nice. So Jeff says, thanks, ARC UK, for the debates. Thanks, Yaron and Greg, for being respectful of each other, even when you disagree. And also, let me say how rare it is to find a debate on the welfare state which goes, which both parties says, I'm going to talk based on morality and not, is the tax going to be 32.8% or 31.2%, which is usually the debate. So I really appreciate that you both went to the center of the topic. So Yaron, final thoughts. Yeah, so I, I think we agree on happiness studies, um, <laughs> skeptical. Um, and, and, and I think it's a, it, 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 they, they mean very little. Um, I, always, I always have problems with, with the kind of commentary that says, yeah, things are okay enough, right? How do you know? How does anybody know? We indeed don't have the parallel universe in which we're five times richer uh, because, because we didn't have a welfare state. And granted, I can't prove that that would happen. Um, uh, in, in, because I can't point to it. Um, and you're right, uh, correlation is not uh, causation, but I would strongly argue that there are good theoretical and empirical reasons to believe that the welfare state drains an economy from growth potential. Um, and that growth is substantial and it hurts. I think a lack of growth hurts those people you're trying to help more than it hurts anybody else. So I think actually in the long run, they are worse off um, as an economic argument. Uh, what kind of society I want to live in, which, which, which was raised a number of times. Um, yeah, I want to live in a society where individuals can be free from the domination of a majority. Talk about slave, wa uh, you know, uh, uh, slave wages. Uh, there's also a sense in which 
when you are impotent to fight against a majority that can vote to have all kinds of things done to you, including 50 plus percent of your money taking away, that feels much more like slavery than it is than a, uh, an employer-employee relationship where either party could walk away um, and, and, and start over. But uh, living in a society where you never know what the voters are going to vote for, uh, you never know what the legislature is going to vote for, and you are impotent in influencing that, and yet they have total control over your life, is, I think, overall scary, and we can see that in some of the uncertainty in, 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 in how seriously people take politics which I don't think should be such an important area in human life as it has become. I think politics should be a minor field in human life, not a major field, but it affects you to the extent that it does today because the majority can pass any law they want. Um, but a lot of our disagreement boils down to a fundamental, I don't think it's just a, a, a definitional issue because I think it's deeper than a definitional issue. And that is with regard to what the word freedom means. I don't consider anybody having their freedom limited because they can't walk into your house and take your stuff. That is not a freedom limiting thing. Um, people shouldn't, don't have. Freedom doesn't encompass those acts. The concept of freedom doesn't encompass those acts that involve violating the rights of other people, that involve violence or coercion against other people. Uh, so uh, it, it is only the defense of property rights and the defense of individual rights that makes freedom possible because it creates the, 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 the a definition of the, of the spaces and the kind of behavior that is a free behavior, what is, what is good behavior and what is not, what is acceptable and what not. And that relates to what is coercion and what is not. Coercing somebody not to steal from me is not coercion. The sin is the initiation of force, not the self-defense. The sin is somebody trying to steal my stuff. The sin is some, somebody walking onto my property. Uh, that is a violation of freedom. It's not me defending myself, violating their freedom. And in that sense, I see a lot fewer conflicts between human beings. I don't think there's a conflict between... Um, I, I don't see every interaction between human beings as, as, as engaging in, in, uh, in conflicts. People have... Uh, you know, boundaries and rights uh, are clear. The criminal is the is in the wrong. Clearly, uh, he, he, you know, I'm not restricting his freedom in any kind of way by defending myself. Um, and and I think that goes to heart of it. But it also is. I, I mean, it's it's funny. We both want to position ourselves as individualists, but I really do think Craig's position ultimately is a collectivist position. It is it is okay to cripple parts of society for the benefits of others. It's okay to use coercion against them um, if it benefits other people. But again, he has a very expansive and I think wrong definition of coercion and what freedom means that allows him to get away with that, um, where I think, I think that should be something he questions. So yeah, thank did. you. Thank you very much to both of you. So Yaron's going to be back next week, but... Let me say something about Greg's work. So you can go to cultureontheoffensive.com and you can see some you can see a, a preview of his book which comes out on the 4th of July. It's called Post-Socratic Dialogues uh, colon Love. Post-Socratic Dialogues Love. And also you'll find there some uh, preview of his book in terms of videos on YouTube. So many thanks, Greg. Uh, Many thanks, Yaron. I hope people appreciate the discussion. Huge thank you to the Super Chatters for your support. Many thanks to the Ayn Rand Institute for the support. And we're going to be back next week, hopefully with a, another great discussion. I appreciate your time and uh, for being, I appreciate you being with us. See you soon. Bye, everyone.